We are in the Gospel of Mark, which should come as not a huge surprise because we've been largely in the Gospel of Mark this year and the Gospel of John also. But we are in Mark chapter 9 today. Chapter 9, and we the verses in the lectionary are from verse 38 to 50. Uh, but I actually think the lead up to the conversation is really, really critical. And it annoys me. The, the lectionary thing is great because it means that I like, we've, we're following a certain plan and we get to be in kind of sync with the broader church who follow the lectionary around the world. But it annoys me because it sometimes chops the sections of the Bible into pieces that I don't think are good sized pieces. It skips out entire. Uh, so what we would say is a, you know, a, a pericope, which is the, the full story. So here we've chopped out, I think, something of the beginning of the story that's important. So I want to give us some context before we jump into this story. Uh, and so the context is that they, uh, Jesus has just told his disciples that he's going to die and then rise again three days later. Now, he does this, I think, three times in the Gospel of Mark, and all three times they don't really get it. And then each time, one of the kind of more central key known named disciples then uh, kind of does something in response to it. Uh, this time, it's kind of followed up with a statement from, the, from John. Uh, but so Jesus has said, I'm going to die, and then that's and then I'm going to rise again. They don't get it because they're pretty hopeless. Uh, and now uh, we find that they are on their way back. They, in fact, they've just arrived back in Capernaum. And you'll remember from when we've looked at the map, Capernaum is right at the northern uh, top of the Lake of Galilee, kind of right in the middle at the top. And they've arrived back there. And Mark records this funny story where then Jesus says to his disciples, uh, so on the road, you guys were arguing. What was all that about? Uh, and there, and then okay, he kind of calls them out and they're a little bit embarrassed uh, and they're embarrassed but, and they don't want to talk about it because they were arguing about who is going to be the greatest, who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom. So Jesus is like, I am going to die. And then on the third day, I'll rise again. And instead of them realizing that Jesus kingdom is going to be very different to what they expect, their immediate response to this then is to argue about who is the greatest. Who's going to have the most accolade, the most power, the most authority? Who's going to sit in the seat next to Jesus? Who is going to be powerful and great? Uh, so classic disciple shenanigans here. And now we jump in uh, from verse 38. Actually, there's this another little interlude immediately before this. Uh, so I'm going to start from verse 36. It says, he took a little child whom he... Uh, whom he placed among them. And taking the child in his arms, he said to them, whoever welcomes one of these little children in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me does not welcome me, but the one who sent me. This is important. And so, like I said, the, the lectionary chops this little bit out. But this section of the scripture, in, in my view, Jesus is defining the boundaries of his kingdom. And he starts with this story about this little child. And he says, when you welcome a child, when you welcome people in my name, you are welcoming me, but you are also welcoming the one who sent me. He's defining the boundaries of his kingdom to include these little children who are in the first century world, the least relevant of all people. Children, women, the sick. There was a whole bunch of categories and classes of people that were just not really cared about and children were in them. So Jesus is saying right here, the boundaries of my kingdom extend to these children. And now this is where John jumps in. Teacher, said John, we saw someone driving out demons in your name and we told him to stop because he was not one of us. You see, these disciples, remember, they've just been arguing about who's the greatest because they are desperate to be special. Now, I know we can, I, like, this is a pretty common human experience. We all want to feel like we are special. We have a, a special calling, a special destiny that we are wonderful and, you know, all those things. But the disciples are really keen. They're like, you gave us authority to drive out demons. Why is it that this bloke, this unknown exorcist, is, is allowed to do these things? So we told him to stop. I think the thing that they were most annoyed by is that the, this imposter was actually being successful at it. Uh, just earlier in, in chapter 9, the, 
Jesus sent out his disciples to, and they couldn't cast out a demon and they were all cranky and they came back and they were all embarrassed about that. So here they are saying, here's a guy who's actually being successful at doing this, but he's not one of us. He's not special. He doesn't have the special commission that we do as your special people. So you should uh, be proud of us because we told him to stop. Now remember, Jesus has just said, even if you accept a child in my name, then that's a good thing. Uh, and here's this bloke who is, who is now casting out demons in Jesus' name and they want to exclude him. And Jesus says in verse 39, Do not stop him, for no one who does a miracle in my name can in the next moment say anything bad about me. For whoever is not against us is for us. Now, I don't know about you, but in my house, dobbing is a big deal. Dobbing is something that my, uh, that my children are very keen on. We had an, uh, an experience the other day where one of my kids came in crying uh, and they were all G'd up for a good old dobbing. They thought they had a very solid case. They came before Judge Jeff and, and they said, uh, I'm trying to do this anonymously, even though there's, there's, I don't have that many children. They came before Judge Jeff and they said, I was pushed uh, by by this other sibling, and they're in tears, and they're very upset about this. They set out the evidence, and it turns out that when the evidence came to bear, that the pushing was in retaliation to a jump scare. A jump scare. One of the other children had come around the corner, and, and the, the, um, uh, the, the accused had jumped out, terrified this poor child, and they had been pushed in response to this. Suffice to say, the ruling did not go as either of them had expected, because my general response to all of these situations is just to punish everyone. <laughs> I find that it reduces the amount of dobbing and the amount of parenting that I have to do. <laughs> I think I'm a bad person, and Jess is online there. I'll probably get in trouble later. Uh, you see now... John is now here dobbing. He's here dobbing and he thinks that he's going to get rewarded. Oh, John, good work, buddy. Good work for telling that exorcist who was casting out demons my name that he's a naughty boy and that he's not allowed to do it because he hasn't been authorized. But Jesus is not interested in his narrow-minded exclusivism. Jesus just doesn't care. Uh, worse than that, Jesus says, Truly I tell you, anyone who gives you a cup of water in my name because you belong to the... Uh, sorry. Truly I tell you, anyone who gives you a cup of water in my name because you belong to the Messiah will certainly not lose their reward. Jesus says, mate, he's casting out demons in my name. He's going to get a reward. If, if all he had done was bring you a cup of water in my name, he would get a reward. See, the narrow view that the disciples have about who is in and who is out and who is special and who is not special is not something that Jesus is willing to entertain. The simple act of giving a glass of water in his name deserves a reward, let alone the driving out of a demon. So Jesus, again, he's already defined his, his kingdom in, in very generous terms with this the little child. And now he defines his kingdom again in very generous terms. He said, but in this verse, Jesus is saying to them, if anyone gives you, the disciples, if anyone on the outside, not one of the people on the inside. If anyone on the outside of your special club or your defined community or you who you think is authorized, anyone on the outside gives you a cup in my name, then they won't miss out on their award. And then he goes on, if anyone causes one of these little ones, those who believe in me to stumble, it would be better for them if a large millstone were hung around their neck and they were thrown into the sea. This is where things start to get a bit serious in this story. See, up until now, it's been children and even, uh, and then, uh, you know, handing out of cups of water and stuff like that. And the, the consequences have not been that dire for anyone. Jesus is saying, no, 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 we're going to have a broader kingdom than you think. We're going to let people in. But now he's like, but if you cause one of the little ones to stumble, you'd be better off having a millstone chucked around your neck and being tossed into the ocean. This is now getting very serious. This word that we have um, that means to, to um, if anyone causes of these little ones to stumble, the word to stumble there is scandalizo. Uh, and it's sometimes translated as cause to sin, but I don't actually, there's no, the Greek word for sin, hamatia, is not in here. I don't think that's what it means here. It's not saying if you make a young Christian, because it defines here those who believe in me, 
If you make them sin, then you'll need to be tossed into the, into the ocean with a millstone around your neck. He's just saying if you cause them to stumble, if you make it difficult for them, now remember, just like you wanted to make it difficult for the children, just like you want to make it difficult for the man casting out demons, just like if you want to make it difficult for people to be in my kingdom, then I got news for you. That's an offense. Now we're talking about crimes. None of this, oh, he cast out a demon or he delivered a cup of water or he welcomed a child. No, 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 no. If you make it difficult for people to come into my kingdom, then you should be worried about having a millstone put around your neck. This is a very serious rebuke here. This is the closest thing that Jesus has to a threat. It's not a cute little story. What kind of obstacles is it that people put in the way of people? Well, we do it in the church then. We see it. In the early church, there were obstacles. There was questions. Do you need to be circumcised or not circumcised? This was a big deal in the early church. Are you allowed in if you're a eunuch? Because the eunuchs weren't allowed in as into the Jewish um, uh, like uh, temple. They weren't allowed there, which is why when Philip went to the eunuch who had been in Jerusalem and he tried to get into the temple and they wouldn't let him, they kind of kicked him out or whatever is, is how I read that. And he's leaving now and Philip finds him and he's... And he says, oh, can I explain this book of Isaiah to you? And he reads from a passage in the book of Isaiah that is just uh, right next to another section that says that the, the eunuchs will be given a place of honor in the house of God. You see, because the eunuchs were, sometimes they were said, you're not welcome. There's a verse in Leviticus, I think, that says, I won't tell you exactly what it says, but it makes it clear that the eunuchs are not welcome. But then in Isaiah, it gets overturned. So now, and then we're not sure. There are boundaries there in the Jewish world for who is in and who is out. If you're a foreigner, you're definitely going to be out. you got to be a real Jew if you want to be in, which is why the idea of circumcision was a big deal. Are you a real Jew in order to be a real Christian? Or in the early church, or sorry, less in the early church, more today in some areas, you're not a real Christian. The stumbling block is, do you pray in tongues? Have you been baptized in the right way? Did you get the sprinkling? Did you get the baby baptism? Did you get the adult baptism? Did you go fully immersed, not fully immersed? These are big deals in some churches, whether or not you are in or whether or not you are out. Whether or not you believe the right things. There is a, uh, in some gatherings of Christians, there is a set of particular doctrinal statements that you have to agree to or adhere to or you are not welcome. You are not allowed in or out. And then in more extreme places, there are things that you have to, uh, not only are there things you have to love, there are things you have to hate if you want to belong. There are people or actions or behaviors or things that if you don't hate the right things, then you will be excluded. You got to tithe the right way. You got to dress the right way. You got to turn up to the right amount of meetings. You got to turn up on time. Seriously, people. People were very late today. Maybe we need to define the boundaries of this kingdom a little more clearly. If you are more than five minutes late, you are out of the kingdom. And I suspect that Jesus would say to me, if you, if you cause people to stumble like that, Jeff, I, it'd be better for you to have a millstone put around your neck and be tossed into the sea. So you are lucky that Jesus is on your side. As Jesus was being crucified, he hung upon a cross and there was uh, the thieves that were hung near him. And he said to that thief who had uh, a, fa a faith in him, today you and I will be walking in paradise. He didn't invent a series of arbitrary stumbling blocks that would get in the way of this man being saved. You see, and many Christians and churches and organizations and institutions historically and today have made complicated what, made, what Jesus made simple. Woe to them. And the same is true when we as Christians live in a way that profanes the name of God and we become a stumbling block for the world. Many, many people will never ever enter into a church because of the way that they have been treated by Christians. The greatest stumbling block to the, um, the explosion of the gospel and evangelism in many places and ways is Christians. And it would be better for us to have a millstone tied around our neck and to be tossed into the ocean. We should be known, the word scandalizo, therefore, uh, causing to stumble, is where we get our word scandal. We should be known not for our scandalous judgment, but for our scandalous love. We should be known for, being, for casting the net wider, for drawing a line that is broader, for allowing more people in, not excluding more people out, for building uh, bigger tables instead of kicking people out of the room. When Jesus says we should... Um, 
He talks about little ones. If anyone causes these little ones, he's not just talking about children. See, in the verse before, when it talked about children, uh, the Greek is paid on. But here, the word is not that. Here, the word, uh, I, I really love this. Um, the word is mikros, which is where we get our word micro. Tiny, small people, the little people. And I love this because there is, uh, and you don't see it in the English, but before they were arguing about who was the most mega, who was the most great. And now Jesus is saying, no, 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 you need to be worried about who is the most micro. So there is this contrast between their argument about mega and micro. So if it's not just talking about little children, who is it talking about? Well, firstly, it's talking about the mega ones, the people who have power. The mega ones are those disciples that had been given authority to go forth. They had a greater responsibility as mega ones, not to determine that they should be given more glory, but to be a servant. They had a responsibility as the mega ones to care for to, and to look after the micro ones. The micro ones in Jesus' day are the ones who have little prestige and little power. So yes, micro ones then were children. And micro ones then were the younger believers in the community or uh, in the first century world, women and the sick. But think about today, the people in our society who are the little ones in the eyes of the world, the people with little influence and little capacity and little money and little prospects and little opportunity and little honor and few advocates. These are the little ones that we need to make sure we don't put stumbling blocks in front of. Jesus is talking about the people who are unseen and unheard and unloved and unwelcome. The little ones in the first century were considered to be unclean and they were deemed unworthy. So Jesus is saying, how, how dare you? If, if this guy casting out demons is not against us then he's definitely for us and if he's for us he can't be against us why would you want to kick him out why would you want to control what he is doing when he's doing it in my name jesus is concerned for the little ones the women the children the poor the alien and foreigner the sick the powerless the disenfranchised these are the micro ones the micros and he turns it back on them he turns it back on his disciples and he says, you should be very concerned if you make these people stumble. If you put something in the way that causes them trouble, then you should be very, very worried. If your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life maimed than with two hands and go to hell where the fire never goes out. And if your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life crippled than to have two feet and be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to stumble, pluck it out. It is better for you to, be, to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into hell. Where the worms that eat them do not die and the fire is not quenched. Now, I want to clear this up first. The word hell here, Gehenna, or Gehenna, uh, this is not talking about Hades, which is the resting place of the dead in the Jewish or Greek worldview. Um, it, it's a, an actual place to the south of Jerusalem. And for a long time, people have said that it was a rubbish dump. And I've talked about that too, because if you look up a commentary, most of them will say that, that the Valley of Himnon or the Valley of Gehenna, that this is the, a place where they took all the rubbish and they took dead bodies and they burned them and all that. But the truth is the most modern research says that's probably nonsense. Uh, in about 1200 AD, a, a rabbi came up with the idea that that's what happened there. And ever since then, everyone's just repeated it. But it probably wasn't a rubbish dump. But what we do know is it was a place where they offered sacrifice to Moloch, where people killed their offspring as um, sacrifice to Moloch and, and burned them and did awful, horrible things there. Moloch is a, a, um, a Canaanite god, a pagan god. So it is a place of, um, of judgment and a place where God was cranky about their behavior. And so this then got turned, the, the mythology of it got increased and increased and increased. Uh, but it, so it became a, um, in, before the, the rabbi in 1200 AD said, no, no, it was a rubbish dump. It was, it was still known as a place of judgment and a place of, of God's um, anger upon people and their behavior. 
which is why we have that verse uh, from Isaiah 66, 24. If you're not following in the Bible, you wouldn't have seen that, that the web... The worms eat them, um, where the worms that eat them do not die and the fire is not quenched. That's from Isaiah. Uh, now, if you go there today, you can see that the whatever fire they're talking about there was metaphoric. There ain't no fires. In fact, they've made a very beautiful park there today. Uh, so the Valley of Hymnon is definitely not a hellfire and burning place anymore. It's actually quite a lovely place. So the imagery here is not trying to make some comment about eternal damnation. That's not what this story is about. Uh, And it does make the idea of plucking out your eye if it causes you to sin or cutting off your hand if it causes you to sin. uh, It does make some interesting reading when we think about purity culture and how we have a tendency to tell women that they need to control or rather we should control their bodies so that they look and behave in a certain way so that men don't have lustful thoughts. And when I read this, it seems to suggest that if men have lustful thoughts, it's their problem. They should pluck out their eye and cut off their hands uh, lest they be judged. So, But even more broadly, this is clearly not about self-mutilation but about self-mastery. This is about saying, be in control of yourselves. But I want to go one step further because I actually think that the interpretation of this in an individualistic way is a very westernized idea. Whenever Jesus talks about the body, and when Paul talks about the body, when the New Testament talks about the body, it's not normally talking about your individual body. It's talking about a more in a more corporate sense. So think about this passage in its context. Jesus is saying, The boundaries of my kingdom are broader. We let the children in. The boundaries of my kingdom are broader. We let that random guy who is casting out demons in, even though you don't know him because he did it in my name. The boundaries of my kingdom are broader. And if you cause the little ones to stumble, well, you better watch out because you might just get tossed into the ocean with a rock around your neck. And then he has this warning about corporately, about if your hand or your eye or your foot causes you to sin, toss it out. And I think what he's saying, if you want to draw boundaries around your kingdom, around my kingdom, here's the people that we toss out. We toss out the ones who make the little ones to stumble. If there is someone in your fellowship, if there is a part of your body that is stopping the little ones from coming to me, that is drawing a narrower kingdom, then get rid of them because they're the problem. The eye that needs to be cast out, the hand that needs to be cast out, the foot that needs to be cast out, those things are actually the person who causes the little person to stumble. That's the thing that needs to be cast out. Jesus is saying, if we're going to draw boundaries around our kingdom, get rid of the people who draw boundaries. Which is a little bit weird. But when we look at this in its context, we see that it's a corporate message, not the individualized message that we like to turn it into. Jesus is defining the boundaries of belonging in his kingdom and he makes it clear that the only people who he wants to put on the outside of it are the people who exclude others, the people who put in stumbling blocks, the people who make it hard for others to belong. Then he says, everyone will be salted with fire. Salt is good, but if it loses its saltiness, how can you make it salty again? Have salt among yourselves and be at peace with each other. If you're a community that doesn't care for, look after, have an agenda for the micro ones, then you are like salt with no saltiness. In uh, some of the translations here, there's a little bit more in the text. uh, And it talks about how, how we are the salt of the sacrifice. Because before they would sacrifice it, I like to think it's before they, before they sacrifice their meat, they um, like to salt it. And before I cook my meat, I like to salt it too. Uh, so I completely understand that. And if the salt has no saltiness, it really ruins it. Now, it's not very Jewish of me, but, you know, a poor crackling with no salt ain't a poor crackling. If the community that you are a part of does not care for the micro ones, then you should cut that out and toss it away. There is a purification, the salt of the sacrifice. Um, Everyone will be salted with fire. It's talking about purification there. That's the other reason we would use salt. You should be much more concerned about yourself and making sure that you are not causing the little ones to stumble than you should be concerned about saying, well, I'm so great, I can tell you who's not welcome. 
Because that's what John was doing. He's saying, we're the authorized real disciples and we should be allowed to decide who is in and who is out. Be like the salt of the sacrifice that flavors, that that purifies, that preserves. And then he says, have salt among yourselves and be at peace with each other. Instead of placing obstacles in the way of the little ones and arguing about who is the greatest and who is in and who is out and just have peace with one another. I think sometimes we complicate things that should be simple. We complicate uh, what it means to become a Christian and to stay a Christian and we complicate what it means to... We argue instead of just having peace with one another. Teacher, said John, we saw someone driving out demons in your name and we told him to stop because he was not one of us. Do not stop him, Jesus said. For no one who does a miracle in my name can in the next moment say anything bad about me for whoever is not against us is for us. Truly, I tell you, anyone who gives you a cup of water in my name because you belong to the Messiah will certainly not lose their reward. If anyone causes one of these little ones, those who believe in me, to stumble, it would be better for them if a large millstone were hung around their neck and they were thrown into the sea. If your hand causes you to sin, rather, I just added that there. If your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life maimed than with two hands and then to with two hands go into hell where the fire never goes out. And if your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life crippled than to have two feet and be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to stumble, pluck it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into hell, where the worms that eat do not die and the fire is not quenched. And everyone will be salted with fire. Salt is good, but if it loses its saltiness, how can you make it salty again? Have salt among yourselves and be at peace with each other. Heavenly Father, I thank you that we can be at peace with each other. I pray that we would be peacemakers, people who bear your peace and carry your peace, and that we would not be a stumbling block to these little ones, those who believe in you, that we would not be a stumbling block to those who would seek you. We would not be a stumbling block to those who are of little power and influence, that the world says are of little consequence. I pray we would not be a stumbling block, but we would be an advocate for them, that we would open the doors wider and our arms wider. Lord, I pray that we would understand that you desire to draw the boundaries of your kingdom around everyone and that we would be great by serving, not by comparing ourselves and trying to remove others. Pray your blessing on us and may we be at peace with one another. In Jesus' name, amen.